with demands to improve gun safety on the rise. Too many guns of the wrong kind are in the wrong hands. State lawmakers are poised to take action this year. Tragedies are happening across the country, it seems, every week. A ban on so-called assault weapons is gaining momentum. Plus, gun sellers may face more lawsuits, and gun buyers may be required to take safety classes. Look at the difference. But critics say gun control advocates are missing the mark. We don't own rifles to assault people with. Emotions should not drive our public policy. Will stricter gun laws improve public safety or make it harder for Washingtonians to protect themselves? It has impacts on domestic violence. It has impacts on suicide rates. Both sides weigh in. Constitutional rights are not subject to public opinion polls. Taking aim at our state's gun control laws. Next on City Inside Out. Welcome to this edition of City Inside Out. I'm your host, Brian Callanan. Amidst an ongoing crisis of gun violence, advocates have targeted this legislative session in Olympia to pass some much stricter laws in our state. Proposals include a ban on the sale of so-called assault weapons, a 10-day waiting period and required safety classes for those who buy firearms, and even a provision to make gun sellers and manufacturers legally liable for negligent sales. Opponents say these new proposals will not improve public safety and infringe upon a right enshrined in the U.S. and Washington state constitutions to bear arms. But new polling numbers show lawmakers may be feeling some pressure to act, and Washington's gun laws are directly in their sights. The Parkland, Florida school shooting on Valentine's Day 2018, where 17 students and staff were killed, changed Robert Shentrup and his family forever. Only one of my sisters made it back home alive. My sister, Carmen Shentrup, who was 16 at the time, was murdered, along with 16 of her fellow peers, teachers, and staff, with an assault weapon. Shentrup soon turned his grief into action, advocating with groups like Team Enough and the Alliance for Gun Responsibility. We all want to be safer, right? We all want to feel secure in our communities. Shentrup says the increasing number of school shootings and other gun violence incidents since his sister's death can be linked to an increasing number of gun owners. Studies show the U.S. now has roughly 120 guns for every 100 residents, by far the highest ratio in the world. It is this connection between the saturation of firearms in our communities and the ease of access to them um, that is really driving the gun violence that we see. Too many guns of the wrong kind are in the wrong hands. State leaders have taken up the challenge from Shentrup and others with an ambitious plan to overhaul our gun laws in Olympia this year. The legislation includes a proposed ban on the sale of so-called assault weapons, requirements for a 10-day waiting period, and safety classes for anyone who buys a gun plus a bill that would allow people to sue gun sellers and manufacturers for the negligent sale of a firearm. Okay, do you want to verify there's no ammo in here? Jane Milhan says the state's way off target. So this is a semi-automatic rifle. She's a certified firearms instructor who was inspired to teach others after an incident 15 years ago when she says two men broke into her house. I'm all for safety training as a firearm instructor, but what I'm opposed to is force training. And then you're going to just slowly pull the trigger. Millhands has a long wait list for classes like these and says the state's training requirements could stop people from exercising their constitutional right to own a gun for a year or more. Take your finger off the trigger. And she says with many crimes committed using illegally obtained guns, a ban on the sale or transfer of these semi-automatic firearms won't do a thing to stop gun violence. If we get more guns away off the street, the only one who's going to be giving up their guns are law-abiding citizens. It's an argument you've heard before. This bill will limit our rights and our ability to bear arms. These weapons of war have no business in our community. But Representative Strom Peterson says this year in Olympia, 
there's something different. This is the first time the bill has ever made it to the House floor. Peterson, a Democrat who began sponsoring gun control legislation back in 2016 after an incident in his district of Muckleteo, says a movement of young people, even young legislators who've been through school lockdown drills, has pushed this bill further than ever before. Their voices have been louder and louder over the last few years, and we finally listened as a legislature. And he says, with a recent cross-cut Elway poll showing 56% of those surveyed statewide in support of outlawing the sale and transfer of most semi-automatic weapons, his bill and the other gun measures in Olympia may have the momentum to become law. I think these are common sense regulations. Many other states have them, and I, and I think they'll help save lives. That's not to say there aren't more fights ahead. All those in favor say aye. Aye! Opposed say nay. Nay! No! The amendment is not adopted. States have to be very careful about how they restrict gun rights. Republican Representative Jim Walsh from the 19th District in Aberdeen points to the U.S. Supreme Court's recent Bruin decision, which says new gun restrictions have to be consistent with the country's, quote, historical tradition of firearm regulation. Plus, our state constitution specifically notes a right for people to own guns for the purpose of self-defense. Guns are tools, and in the wrong hands, they can be devastating tools, and in the right hands, they can be tools of justice. Walsh says behind the push to pass these bills, a court challenge is right around the corner. I believe these uh, these proposals are constitutionally dubious and are very likely to be overturned. But before that potential fight, there's a fight to the finish of the legislative session, with the future of gun regulations hanging in the balance. And joining me to discuss a little bit more about these issues, I have with me Dylan O'Connor, Government Affairs Director for the Alliance for Gun Responsibility. Dylan, good to have you here. And I also have with us Dave Workman, Editor-in-Chief of TheGunMag.com, a publication of the Second Amendment Foundation. We have a ton of ground to cover today. I want to try to touch on several gun bills that the state's considering this session. And I'll, let's start with uh, House Bill 1240. So this is the proposed ban on the sale or transfer of what the bill calls assault rifles, military-style semi-automatic rifles. An important point, this bill would not take away anyone's gun. It specifically focuses on when a firearm of this type is sold or transferred. So this bill has been around for six years, Dylan. It made it to the, to the floor for the first time here in 2023. Lawmakers passed it out of the House here in early March. Talk about why you believe and why lawmakers believe a bill like this is needed and also what impact it could have. The top six uh, fa you know, ranked by fatalities uh, in mass shootings in the United States have all been, uh, you know, involved assault weapons. Mm -hmm. um, research shows that when assault weapons are used in mass shootings, up to six times more people are shot. 70% uh, more people are killed. Um, and if we had, you know, a federal assault weapons ban or a state level assault weapons ban in place, um, there's data supporting that 70% fewer fatalities and, and injuries might occur. I'll also add that the bill's been around for six years, but this year uh, is a little different in that we just feel like the psychological place politically mm. uh, this year is completely different than it has been uh, in previous years. Um, I think we've done a lot of work in Washington state to make sure that you know, folks are folks are taking good votes on these bills. For okay, sure. yeah. uh, Dave, what's your response to what Dylan is saying, and what impact do you think a measure like House Bill 1240 would have on the public? Well, first, we're going to have to find out whether or not it's constitutional. Yeah, uh, there's uh, three cases that I know of right now in federal court: one in Maryland, one in California, one in in Oregon. Okay, uh, challenging the constitutionality of yeah. an, a so-called yeah. assault weapons ban. Yeah. They're not really assault weapons. They're not weapons of war at all. They're semi-automatic rifles. Uh, and beyond that, not everybody wants to vote for this in Olympia, too. You'll find a lot of people who are opposed to it. Mm -hmm. And for not just the reason that there are pending federal lawsuits, but they just think it's, it's the wrong way to go. Mm -hmm. If you look at the FBI uniform crime statistics for any given year, Rifles of any kind, including semi-automatics, are used in a fraction of homicides in the country, anywhere from two to four percent, and yet they always seem to fall into into the uh, focus simply because of the appearance of these things, but they don't operate any differently than any other semi-automatic rifle, uh, like the Winchester 100 or uh, Remington 7600. They're, they're uh, basically semi-automatic rifles, uh, one press of the trigger, one 
thing goes bang and that's it. And just with regard to that, do you think this is going to have an impact on public safety that is positive? I know a lot of lawmakers think so. Well, a lot of lawmakers can think what they want. I'm not sure if it is or not because uh, the, the most prevalent firearm involved in crime is a handgun. And we already know handguns are protected by the Second Amendment. Uh, and it's not too much of a stretch of anybody's imagination that uh, in, in the aftermath of the Bruin ruling back in uh, June of last year. U.S. Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Uh, I think that uh, the lower federal courts are probably going to come down on the side of uh, these things are protected by the Constitution. So banning them is going to be pretty tough. Got it. And I'm going to come back to that legal argument in just a little bit. But Dylan, I just wanted to talk about this because I've heard it from a number of different people who are in favor of uh, making sure that their gun rights are protected here, that this really wouldn't have that much of an impact on public safety. You heard what Dave was talking about with handguns, that those are actually more prevalent in crime here. This is only going to restrict the rights of law-abiding people. I want to make sure I cover that point with you. Yeah, sure. Well, I'll, to, to just point out, you know, there's a big difference between uh, a semi-automatic, you know, 22 and a uh, AR-15 with a 30-round magazine, right? Okay. One is able to shoot 30 rounds into a crowd of people in less than a minute, and the other is just, just simply not capable of doing that, that level of damage. Um, I'll also say that, you know, these, and, and we'll talk about this more, but sure. uh, time and time again, um, for the last several decades, um, federal courts at, at the Court of Appeals level have upheld firearms regulations and gun safety laws as constitutional. We can dig into that a little bit okay, more. Okay, please, yeah. But, but for sure, yeah, I mean, these, these laws are just not in conflict with the Second Amendment. There was a poll back in December, Crosscut Elway did this up, and 56% of the people that were polled said we would support a ban on the sale or transfer of most semi-automatic weapons. You have a lot of legislators, you have a lot of people in the public who are saying we don't want these guns to be bought and sold. Can you respond to that? Sure. Uh, first, uh, remember that most of these uh, pellet court rulings that Dylan mentioned, that was prior to the Bruin ruling of last June, and the courts are going to have to go through a lot of those cases, I think, because they're, they're going to have to be, be reconsidered. Now, as far as the, the public opinion polls, yeah. Uh, I think we're all pretty happy that constitutional rights are not subject to public opinion polls. A right is a right, and it's very special. We don't decide rights at, at the voting booth. We don't decide rights by taking an opinion poll. Uh, that's a right. I, I want to, uh, if, if I could, move on to House Bill 1143 here. So this is the measure establishing a 10-day waiting period to purchase a firearm and mandatory safety training. As you remember, everybody, Washington voters approved a 10-day waiting period to purchase semi-automatic guns in 2018. So we already have that in place. Dave, let me ask you this question here. What are your thoughts about this idea, expanding that waiting period to all firearms and also adding in that safety training requirement? Well, how long of a waiting period do you put on any other constitutionally protected right? I, I don't know of any. Hmm. Um, you, you don't have to wait uh, to vote. You don't have to wait to uh, get an attorney if you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, know, you have your rights to exercise there. Um, I'm not sure that it would help at all. People who are determined to commit mayhem are going to do it. And I think time and again we've seen that happen. Uh, the uh, the guy that uh, fired all those shots and killed all those people in Las Vegas, he spent uh, well months, if not a couple of years, mm -hmm. getting the firearms that he used in that thing. In a ten day waiting period, he he probably thought it was a big deal. Mm -hmm. If if that had been the law at that time, I don't think it would have stopped him at all. And in at the same time. How much of an inconvenience do you want to put on a law-abiding citizen who has committed no crime at all? Fair enough. And Dylan, do you have a response to this piece about the waiting period, the training, et cetera? Yeah, absolutely. I will say that a 10-day waiting period and, and the, the more you know, we can delay folks in crisis from obtaining a firearm. We're talking about suicide potentially here. So 75 percent of firearm deaths in Washington state are suicides, right? So, you know, I mean, it, it has impacts on domestic violence. It has impacts on suicide rates. It has impacts on homicide rates as well. Um, but putting a barrier between the immediate availability of a firearm who somebody could be in crisis and the person across the counter may not be able to evaluate that appropriately. Mm -hmm. Um, just a mandatory 10-day waiting period is a wonderful public health. If I could follow up on that training piece, though, excuse me, sure, just to yeah. follow up on that training piece, I talked to one instructor who was saying, 
we put a big demand out there for gun safety courses, it could be months, it could be a year before a law-abiding citizen could actually get a firearm. Do you have some thoughts about that? Well, you know, the safety training courses that, that are delineated in the bill are the ones that are already publicly available okay. as incentivized by 1639, passed okay. in 2018. So these are not, they don't, they don't um, the current version of the bill does not include a live fire training okay. course, which, you know, raises the cost a little bit, does make things a little less available. So we kept that in mind when we were when we were drafting this, the current version of the yep. bill. Got it. Dave, did you have a response to this piece? Well, I'm a certified firearms instructor. That's right. And frankly, I don't know why anybody should be forced to take a training course in order to exercise a constitutionally protected right. I'm not saying that training is a bad idea. That's, that's nonsense. Everybody who owns a firearm uh, should avail themselves, whether it's a woman or a man, uh, to, to get competent training from a competent firearms instructor, mm -hmm. especially if they, they bought a gun for personal protection. Uh, but the notion that you have to go do something that might cost you a, a bit of money in order to exercise a right that's protected by both the state and federal constitutions, I'm not sure that that could even fly if it was tested in court. Yeah. You know, we're, we're in a whole new era right now because of the Bruin ruling. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think a lot of ground still has to be plowed mm. to depend on what is right under the Constitution and, and what can be uh, expanded in terms of uh, uh, gun control. Yeah, yeah. I, I promise we'll get to those legal <laughs> issues. But did you have any rejoinder to that that you wanted to bring up, Dylan, with regard to the training and, and the requirement forcing people essentially to have this training? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we want to incentivize responsible firearms ownership. And part of the safety training is about just understanding the data surrounding owning a firearm and safe storage practices, things okay. like that, making sure that folks lock up their firearms and safely store them so they don't get accessed by a minor or a prohibited person, right? Yeah. These are just basic basic public health safety okay. measures that we, you know, we educate people on their medication. We ask folks to take a driving course for their license. None of that's immediate. You can't just walk in, get a car without a license, right? We want to make sure that we're we're making sure the folks are as safe as possible. Got it. Wait a minute. Please. Driving is not a constitutionally protected right. Driving is a privilege and you know it. Okay. Don't start comparing driving with owning a firearm, which is protected by the Constitution. You know, that, that is such a specious argument. And I, even the governor brought that up here a couple of months back. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I just had to roll my eyes because he knows better. I would like to move on to Senate Bill 5078 here if I could. This would make gun sellers and manufacturers <laughs> legally liable for the negligent sale of a firearm. And this is something that states like California, Delaware, New Jersey, and New York have put into law. Dylan, I wanted to bring this up because the basic thought is if you're a victim of gun violence, Violence, you could potentially sue a gun seller or manufacturer. And I wanted to ask how this would work because federally we have this 2005 Protection of Lawful Commerce in Arms Act. I know you're all familiar with this. Basically, it says the gun industry cannot be held liable for the harm coming from its products. Some thoughts about what this bill is talking about, 5078. Yeah, well, I think it's, you know, it's important that we incentivize industries that have a public health risk to make sure that they are engaging with with uh, their sales and, and, and you know, folks who are purchasing and acquiring firearms, uh, just making sure that we're as safe as possible. Yeah. And you know, we want to make sure that we disincentivize inappropriate behavior, including uh, advertising practices that target younger folks or over-militarized uh, you know, sort of advertising practices, and just making sure that the firearm industry members are responsible members of society. Yeah. And like we w hold you know, cigarette manufacturers accountable for the public health threat that they pose on society, or, uh, fire, or uh, vehicle manufacturers for a faulty product, we want to make sure that that folks in the industry are being incentivized to behave responsibly. The legal method by the states has been successful in some cases, notably for the families of the nine victims of the Sandy Hook shootings in Connecticut. They won $73 million in a settlement with Rem Remington in that case. Well, I, I, and I wanted to talk about this, just what impact you think a measure like 5078 could have in the state of Washington if it passes? Remington didn't settle anything. Remington's insurers settled that. Remington okay. didn't even exist when that happened. Remington right. at that they time were found had been liable though. Is what they had been dissolved, and okay. and the uh, insurance companies cut their losses. They they decided to uh, uh, go along with that. the The notion that you hold somebody r responsible financially for the harm that's created by someone else using their product. 
believe me, the auto manufacturers are watching this one really closely. Mm -hmm. uh, again, uh, I think you know we're going to have to fall back on what is constitutional. Cigarettes, there's nothing in the, in, okay. in the Bill of Rights about smoking. Mm -hmm. And uh, nobody thought about vehicles uh, back in 1791, and that's where the Supreme Court ruling has taken us. He's trying to guide us in that way. And, yeah. and so, you know, I, I here again, I think that uh, when they run up against the federal law, mm -hmm. especially in light of the Bruin ruling, uh, we're going to see a lot of attorneys making a lot of money. Okay. I, I guess I just want to get to that basic point, though. What responsibility does the gun industry have to reduce gun violence? Do well, you think they have none? I mean, what are you saying? I don't know anybody in the firearms industry who isn't responsible. I know a lot of those people. I've okay. dealt with them for years. Um, no gun maker that I know of has ever marketed a firearm just so somebody could go out and, and commit mayhem with it. Okay. Uh, you look at the number of firearms that are owned in the United States right now, somewhere north of 400 million according to some estimates. Mm -hmm. and. Only a, a, a small fraction of those firearms are ever involved in a violent crime. Okay. Uh, the, the numbers here in Washington State are kind of reflective of that. Uh, we've probably got a million and a half to two million gun owners in this state. Mm -hmm. I know we've got almost 700,000 uh, concealed pistol license in this state. Okay. Uh, and rarely do any of those people ever get involved in, in a, a violent crime. Or, yeah. And so the gun manufacturers market their uh, products to the responsible consumer. If those guns are wind up stolen okay. or uh, whatever, they could be involved in a crime. I just, I just think about this though, Dave. I mean, when you see ads like Bushmaster saying, your man card is being reissued and, and there's a, a photo of an AR-15. I mean, what goes through your mind when you see something like that? Because I think some of these ads can be inflammatory in some ways. Well, I, I look at those ads as maybe trying to sell a, a product to some 20-something guy who, okay. who wants to play Rambo. I don't know. I mean, okay. you, you look at those things and you wonder, gee, maybe that's, okay. that's not what would appeal to me as a firearms okay. owner or as somebody wanting to buy one. Okay. Um, but, you know, they, they have a broad audience out there, and sometimes that gets people to buy them. I don't think that appeals to the kids at all. Mm -hmm. I think that's, the, the, you know, the early, the 20-something people that, that are looking for maybe a, a, a gun to shoot in a three-gun match, or they want to okay. you know, go out and compete someplace. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it, that's, that's the kind of mentality I think that's I think, doing. I think Dave just said it. We don't want to market firearms to 20-somethings 20 20 that want to play Rambo, right? That's very dangerous. Right? We can't control for what a, a, you know, a young man who, who might have, uh, a, be experiencing a mental health crisis or be ideologically motivated to violence. We certainly don't want to take the risk of advertising firearms to that person. Um, and I will say, you know, Dave said that they're not advertising to children. I'd push back on that. There actually are uh, a growing number of advertisements from the, from the firearms industry specifically targeting Kit children to try to make sure that when they do turn of age that they're buying their products. Mm. It's an AR Junior product on, on the market right now that is a scale model AR-15 that doesn't shoot live rounds, of course, but um, is specifically like, looks like dad's gun, mm. right? Um, I don't, if that's not marketing to kids, I don't know what is. All right, Ed, Ed, let me, I wanna make sure I dive into some of these legal issues. Dave brought this up earlier with this Bruin decision here. Are you worried that any changes the state makes to our gun laws, if these measures do pass, would not survive a court challenge? The Bruin decision and, and Heller before it does not say that firearm safety laws are unconstitutional and that all gun safety laws are unconstitutional. In fact, both Scalia during in the Heller case and in both the majority and concurring opinions for Bruin state this is not to be interpreted as an end all on firearms regulation laws. It just isn't that. Right, so Bruin at an 80,000 foot level was uh, challenging a case in New York that mm -hmm. had a process by which they issue CPLs called shall issue. Yeah. So that law enforcement could use discretion on whether or not they actually uh, permitted somebody to own a, a CPL um, based on local law enforcement mm -hmm. discretion. Um, that was the part that was ruled unconstitutional. And the other important part of Bruin is that they ended what's called the two-step test. And I promise I'm going to go as quickly Please, as yeah, possible. Yeah, do it. So the two-step test uh, was a process by which courts of appeals around the country 
uh, process Second Amendment claims. The first step being um, whether or not the government can prove that the regulated behavior uh, or the uh, you know dispositional behavior around the firearm mm -hmm. that they're looking to regulate is outside the scope of the original intent of the Second Amendment. Okay. It was step one. Step two is uh, an evaluation or an analysis on whether or not the law, and how close the law gets to what they interpret as the core of the Second Amendment, okay. and what the legal burden, the law's burden on the right is. Okay. And so they're looking for the government to prove that um, the the law does not, you know, imp impugn the core of the Second Amendment. And mm -hmm. up until very recently, like Dave says. Uh, courts of appeals interpreted that core as self-defense in the home per Heller. Mm -hmm. Now what's happened after Bruin is that two-step test has been thrown out and firearms laws are now going to be looked at under the lens of historical mm -hmm. analysis and historical precedent. Luckily there's an ocean of historical precedent around firearms law around the country that we're starting to look at more deeply. And why that's, even with that, why it's so dangerous, why the Bruin decision is so dangerous is, you know, in 1810, 1820, the concept of domestic violence, for example, and a prohibited person around those behaviors was completely different. You know, mm -hmm. women were more viewed as property, for example, yeah. and it just sets us up for some strange legal challenges and potentially dangerous rulings. Got it, Dave, a lot to unpack there. Some thoughts about Bruin and what Dylan's saying. Well, I'm not too sure Bruin was dangerous at all. I think Bruin reminded us that there's a constitution and that we have to live by it. We just can't invent things as we go along. And that's been the problem uh, ever since uh, the Heller ruling. The lower federal courts uh, decided to create this two-step process. Mm -hmm. The Supreme Court last year said, no, wait a minute, that's not yeah. the way the, this works. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think uh, Clarence Thomas uh, was a genius when he wrote that. He said, mm -hmm. no, we can't do that. We're, we're going to stick with the Constitution because that's that's what the country lives by. Okay. Uh, I don't know that that's dangerous at all. Yes, we've got people who commit crimes dating back all the way to um, you know, Adam and Eve sure. and, okay. and their sons Cain and Abel. Cain right. used a rock. He that didn't guy, get a, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. it, it wasn't the rock's fault, it was Cain's fault. Okay, so. okay, all right. I, I appreciate all this back and forth and we need to wrap up. If we okay. can do the 30 second version, I'd really appreciate it, Dylan. Some final thoughts for lawmakers working on these issues in Olympia. Yeah, it's the right thing to do. Uh, you know, we expect that these laws will be challenged in court. Uh, I think almost everything that we've passed in the last several years, especially at the ballot initiative level, has been challenged. They've been upheld. Um, we are in a little place uh, in limo in the Ninth Circuit. Like, like Dave says, there are some things waiting to be, to be ruled on and some things that have gone back and forth. But it's not so certain or it's not such a precarious position where we shouldn't do anything. Got and it. we feel really confident about our ability to, to defend those things. And I mean, these, the, the slate of gun violence prevention policies on the docket this year are, you know, altogether a huge step forward in public safety and public health. Thank you. 30 second version, Dave, to wrap up. Well, uh, I'm not sure if it's a, a step forward to do something that's unconstitutional. We got to keep that in perspective. And the ballot initiative, that's still in the court. It's still alive. And, and frankly, it was kicked back for further consideration because of the Bruin ruling. So as I said earlier, the Bruin ruling it, you know, we're going to be uh, exploring a lot of strange, interesting ground from now on because of that. Okay. Thank you both for your input here, and we will be right back. What are people saying on social media about the proposal to ban so-called assault weapons? One person writes, This legislation is an important and necessary step towards common sense gun safety in Washington. Another person says, Focus on harsh penalties for illegal possession and gun crimes, not on restriction of our constitutional rights. We'd like to know what you think. Send us an email at contact at seattlechannel.org or find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Coming up next week, more than half a million Washingtonians face a hunger cliff as federal pandemic food benefits come to an end. With increasing food prices and shrinking donations, Area food banks are struggling to keep their shelves stocked. Hear from Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal and other leaders about the urgent work to combat food insecurity and alleviate poverty in our state. That's on the next City Inside Out. I hope you join us. <laughs>